so we are here with Callum Chase. Callum is author of several books, and they are uh, The Two Singularities, The Economic Singularity, and Surviving AI. Callum, thank you for joining us here on Flight 1080. I did get a chance to check out some of The Economic Singularity, which I think is absolutely fascinating. You know, I was surprised when I, when I was uh, looking for guests to, to a book regarding AI, I was looking for somebody more, or I was expecting somebody who was more into the darker side of AI. You seem to be more optimistic about uh, where artificial intelligence is going. Yes, that's right. I am optimistic, but there are really serious challenges. Um, I think we can have a great world if we uh, deploy AI and uh, use AI uh, sensibly, but we have to um, we have to rise to some serious challenges. If we do, then everything will be really good. Okay, so so what what makes you so optimistic? Whereas uh, for the most part, or maybe we just seem to gravitate more towards the the naysayers and the the people who uh, seem to have a darker view. What makes you so uh, optimistic? Why do you feel this way? Actually, I think the people who are often seen as being naysayers. Um, are being slightly misrepresented. I mean, take Elon Musk, for instance. Mm -hmm. People think he's a complete naysayer. What he actually said um, way back in 2014 was that artificial intelligence will either be the best thing or the worst thing to happen to humanity. And I think he's absolutely right. Um, if we were, I mean, he, he talks mostly about superintelligence, which I call the second singularity. It's when we create an artificial general intelligence, that's a machine which has all the cognitive abilities of an adult human, and it quickly goes on to become a super intelligence, and we become the second smartest species on the planet. This isn't going to happen tomorrow, and it's not going to happen in the next 10 years or so, probably. Uh, a lot of people think maybe 50 years, maybe 100 years. Um, now, if we do that, if we do create this super intelligence, and let's say it doesn't like us, or it has uh, goals and aims for itself, which are really inconvenient to us. Like, for instance, it decides to change the composition of the atmosphere on this planet. Okay. That could be really, really bad for us. <laughs> yes. Um, so, so there are some some major challenges, as I say. In, in that case, the challenge is to make sure that the very first superintelligence, if we're going to create one, really, really likes us and understands us better than we understand ourselves. If we manage to meet that challenge then we would have an entity on this planet which is much, much smarter than the most, the most intelligent of us. And it could, you know, it's reasonable to believe it could solve all our major problems like poverty or war or death or political disagreement. Um, life wouldn't get boring. It wouldn't get samey. There'd be a lot of variety and uh, the opportunity for great creativity. But we could remove an awful lot of our worst problems. So, I, as I say, I think the artificial intelligence can bring great, great benefits if we meet the challenges. Okay, now, is there ever a, a chance that it will surpass us in intelligence? I'm assuming that it will. You know, you brought up a couple examples. Um, one was uh, the chess match between Watson and, and whoever, uh, Kasparov, was that his name? Uh, that was, the, that's right, that chess match was between Gary Kasparov, uh, a Russian chess player, probably the best human chess player ever, mm -hmm. and an IBM system called Deep Blue. Okay, now now you you point out, um, I, I had never thought about this, that, that was just a matter of crunching numbers and, and probabilities. That's, I don't know if that would really count as artificial intelligence. What, what is the definition of artificial intelligence? Let's Let's go there. Yeah. So two words. Artificial is easy, means not made by humans and not made by uh, alien species. Mm -hmm. So, uh, sorry, sorry, made by humans or made by an alien species. So not uh, generated by evolution. Uh, intelligence is trickier because we can't really define what human intelligence is. And human intelligence is probably only one of an enormous space of possible intelligences. But for argument's sake, the, the sort of quickest, easiest way to define it it, it, intelligence is the ability to solve a range of problems in a range of different environments. So you can't just feed in some data and get a, an answer which is pre-programmed to come out. And arguably, that is mostly what was going on in Deep Blue from Watson when it beat Gary Kasparov. What's happened uh, since, since 2012, actually, there was a big bang in artificial intelligence because a man called Jeff Hinton and some colleagues in Toronto managed to get a, a, a branch of statistics called machine learning to work with AI. And since then, we have machines which are creative. They're not human. They don't think. They're not conscious. They don't have empathy or anything like that. But they are creative. 
and they learn and they are adaptable. So they, they do show signs of intelligence. These are narrow intelligences. Um, a nice description of them is that they are like, uh, they're, they're like a machine which can play the perfect chess move, completely unaware that it's in a building which is burning down. <laughs> what is it that makes us so different from them? Will we be indistinguishable? I mean, will they lack creativity? Will they be able to create music, poetry, sculptures, paintings, that kind of stuff? Or is that strictly a human trait that will never transfer over to, uh, never be a part of artificial intelligence? The honest truth is that nobody knows. And um, the answer will probably depend to some extent on how they are created. So superintelligence is likely to come either one of two ways. One is that we carry on developing the AI systems that we already have. As I said, uh, machine learning and a subset of it called deep learning are the most powerful techniques of AI at the moment. But they won't get us all the way to superintelligence on their own, probably. We'll have to reintegrate an older form of AI called symbolic AI. Uh, and there's, there's some new, there's, there's more conceptual leaps that will need to be made, and we don't know what they are, and they don't, we don't know how long they might take. That's one way to create superintelligence. The other is to uh, re reverse engineer a human brain. So what you do is you take a, a human brain, preferably from somebody who stopped using it, and you slice it really thinly, and you scan all those slices, and you use the data you get from that to to create what's called the connectome which is the wiring diagram of the human brain, uh, by analogy with the genome. And if you get that wiring diagram with enough detail and you make a copy of it in a machine and you get that machine working, it will do what a brain does. And what a brain does is it creates minds. Now, that would probably be quite similar to a human mind because it was modeled on a human mind, whereas the other route, um, just building on deep learning, machine learning, and so on, will probably create quite an alien sort of mind. So we don't really know what we're likely to create when we create superintelligence, and whether it's human-like or completely alien will depend largely, probably, on the way we get there. Wow, that, that, that is, wow, that is, uh, 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 that blows me away. That is fascinating. I love this topic. I love it. Uh, what stage in artificial intelligence? First of all, where is where was the beginning? Where do you think uh, we are now, and what is the inevitable future okay so the where we are now is at the beginning mm. um it's a ai is an overnight sensation which has been 60 years in the making it started in 1956 at a conference in america at a place called dartmouth college uh, and for a long time people thought wow this is exciting but really it didn't achieve very much until as i say there was this big bang in 2012 and now we're at the beginning in the sense that we are starting to see systems at work. So Google search uses a lot of AI. Uh, Facebook facial recognition does. Uh, when you use a map and it tells you not only how long it will take you to get from where you are to your destination, but also reroutes you if there's a traffic accident or something, that, that all uses AI. Amazon uses AI uh, extensively. It is starting to penetrate the rest of the economy, but it's quite slow because it's not easy to do this stuff at the moment. It takes a huge amount of compute power, a lot of data, and very smart uh, machine learning researchers who to, to wrangle the data. So we're really at the, the very early stages. But the thing is, with AI, like a lot of uh, machine technologies, you're always at the beginning because we're on what's called an exponential growth curve. So. Moore's law is, is the observation that uh, machines get twice as powerful every 18 months. Mm -hmm. And that, that is an exponential process because we're doubling performance every 18 months. And when you do that, every step you take is equal to the sum of all the previous steps. So you're always at the knee of an exponential curve. You're always at the beginning. Where we're going, I think we will go to superintelligence. And my hunch is it will take somewhere between 50 and 100 years. Nobody knows. Um, and I also think that before we get there, another very interesting thing that's going to happen, which I call the economic singularity, is that an awful lot of people are going to find themselves unable to do a job for money. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is that machines are getting much more, <clears throat> more and more powerful, more and more smarter. And before long, they'll be able to do most things humans can do for money better, better cheaper and faster than the humans can. When I say before long... This isn't going to happen tomorrow or in the next five years, but I think we'll start seeing it happening in about 10 years. 
And I think it'll be in full flight in maybe 20 to 30 years. And we have to prepare for that. That's the other, the other really big challenge that we have to prepare for. You know, that, that's the one thing I found very interesting about your book and why I say you, you seem optimistic about it was because you mentioned, and I have to tell you, I got kind of defensive when you when you pointed out that machines are going to be taking a lot of our jobs. And I, I got really defensive as a human and started thinking, well, wait a minute, they can't do this, can they? Can they do? And then I started thinking, boy, you know what? There's a lot of things that they can replace us. Uh, and so then I started coming up with insults for these robots, uh, like rust bucket, do you think? Will they have emotions? I mean, will that will that hurt their feelings if I start calling them names like that? They've taken my job, so now I start calling, going out there and calling them rust buckets or calculators or whatever I call them. Will they have feelings? Is that part of intelligence as well? Uh, before they get to artificial general intelligence, before they get to the point where they are human equivalent, they don't care what you call them. They don't care if you if you shoot them with a gun. Uh, they have no consciousness. They have no feelings. So you can call them what you like. Mm-hmm. So uh, that'll never hurt their feelings. I mean, what is, what is uh, you mentioned AGI? That is different from AI, correct? AGI is short for artificial general intelligence. So um, the moment we have the, the AIs that we have are all narrow intelligences. And, and uh, if you if you have in mind that idea of a machine which can play the perfect move while it's in a house that's burning down, that's a that's a narrow intelligence. It can do one thing. To superhuman level it can play chess to a superhuman level it can't do anything else it can't get itself from one room to another and it can't even uh, have any awareness that it's in a burning building so the, the the change that happens when we get to general intelligence which is what humans have we have a general intelligence that is when they, they get to human level and quickly become super intelligence so all the the joblessness question uh, which I call the economic singularity that comes well before that um, and that's the challenge that I think we really need to address now because we're not thinking about it uh, seriously, which we should be. Now, this has been happening since uh, since Henry Ford uh, invented the the uh, assembly line, right? Losing our jobs to to automation, we start b- um, incorporating machines and robots into uh, building these cars. This has been happening little by little, but now all of a sudden, it seems like it is it is happening um, at a rapid pace. You you mentioned, I think you already posted an article this morning about truck driving and how. Uh, in the UK, at least, they're looking to replace truck drivers with um, automatically in, uh, you know, it's artificial intelligence-driven trucks. Yeah, that's right. Uh, self-driving trucks, and of course, this is being pioneered in America, along with most things to do with art- artificial intelligence. America is in the lead. I mean, you'll you'll be pleased to hear, uh, and I'm sure you know most people living where you are in California are aware that Silicon Valley is the absolute ground zero of, of artificial intelligence. Um, you can't rest on your laurels because China's catching up fast. China had a wake-up call when a, a system developed by a company called DeepMind, which is a subsidiary of Google based in London, uh, beat the world's best player of a game called Go, which is a board game, much more complicated than chess, and it's very, very popular in China and, and greater China. And since then, China has uh, invested huge amounts in artificial intelligence and is catching up fast uh, with the U.S., um, you may be pleased to know, or you may not, that uh, Europe is nowhere. We're not. Maybe that will change. Maybe it won't. Um, so, yes, self-driving vehicles, which are being pioneered in California and in Arizona, um, are almost certainly going to make most truck drivers and most other professional drivers, and that's 5 million people in the USA, uh, jobless. They have to find new jobs. Now, it isn't going to happen tomorrow. Um, the, the technology isn't perfect yet. A Google self-driving car travels about 3,000 miles before it needs to hand over to the human because it gets confused. Something happens that it's not expecting. And they have to get that 3,000 miles a lot higher. But they're already a great deal safer than humans. You know, humans every year around the world, we kill 1.2 million people because we're not very good at driving, because we get tired, we get drunk, we, uh, we get distracted. And we look at our mobile phones, and machines don't do that. They don't do any of that. So they're already a lot safer, but we have to get them to be as as close to perfect as possible before we really unleash them. But when we do, it seems to me inevitable that professional drivers are going to have to find another job. Now, we don't know how long that will take, and we don't know how long the process of changeover will take, but, you know, not not very long, I think. Self-driving cars, it seems to be the most tangible, um, uh, 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 the most... Uh, uh, yeah, the most tangible thing that we can 
that we have as far as artificial intelligence. You know, what is this going to mean to our lives? Well, there's a self-driving car. It is the most tangible thing that we see. It, it's here right now. It is, though it has cost a few lives here in um, in the United States. One, well, I... there was one, there was one uh, fatal accident uh, where a self-driving car, uh, which is an Uber car in Arizona, mm -hmm. uh, ran over a woman and killed her. Right. Now, the, the police who attended the incident, they announced immediately that it wasn't the car's fault. Since then, there's been a lot of investigation still going on, and we haven't had the final official report yet, so we don't really know what happened. But that is um, a, a statistically really small number of accidents. And Google's cars have now driven more than 5 million miles, around, mostly around California and Arizona, and they haven't unambiguously caused a single accident. They certainly haven't caused a single serious accident yet. So that's a, that's a driving record which no human has. You know, they're already, these things, safer than humans. But because, you know, there, there is a, quite reasonably, there's a, a fear of machines, and we do not want to be run over by machines. It's bad being run over by a human, but emotionally, <laughs> we're, we're less ready to be run over by machines. So we want them to be really close to perfect. We put up with pretty terrible driving from humans, but we won't put up with that from machines. <laughs> Yeah, you got a point there. You you got a point there. Uh, all right, let's see. Uh, we talked about that. Um, what what's next for self driving cars? I mean, are we really going to be? I heard that the next step is to remove steering wheels, uh, the brake pedal, and the gas pedal from these things, and basically put you in a pod that you have no control over, and you just uh, trust it. Just trust the, the the car. Yeah, that that is in a sense that's the end game. So, Google made an, a really interesting discovery where they were developing these things. They um, their initial plan was to have cars which were driven by the machines most of the time, but every now and then would kind of sort a little alarm, say to the human, oh, I'm a bit confused now, I need you to take over. What they found was that very quickly, after humans uh, spend a little bit of time in a car that could drive itself, they stopped paying attention. And they found that the, the, the people who were kind of chaperoning these things around in test were turning around at 60 miles an hour looking for something on the back seat rather than paying attention to what was going on in front of them. So they quickly realized you have to get to the point where the machine can always drive itself. And so in that case, yes, you do not need a steering wheel. You don't need a pedal. That is, that's where it will go. And as you said, self-driving vehicles are going to be the most tangible demonstration of artificial intelligence. But as I said earlier, Google Search uses it a lot. Uh, Google Maps and Apple Maps use it a lot. But when people see self-driving cars wandering around, which are essentially robots, when they see all these robots doing something which we don't allow humans to do until they're in late adolescence, they're going to definitely think, wow, that's a powerful technology. And look, it's laying off all these drivers. They're all having to get new jobs. How long before the machine comes to my job? That will be a question we all start asking ourselves. I think that is going to happen in around 10 to 15 years. Nobody knows when, but I think that's going to happen. And I think before that happens, the big challenge for us is we have to have a plan. We have to have an answer to what is everybody going to do when the machines take a lot of our jobs. Will we create lots of new jobs? Or could we have the, a, 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 perhaps a better economy where most humans, or many humans anyway, don't have to do jobs, and we get an income which we don't have to work for, but we just get it because we're citizens. And I think that is a, a really interesting possibility, but I think it's only possible if we do another step, which is we have to create what some people call an economy of abundance or uh, the Star Trek economy, in which most of the goods and services that you need for a very good life are very, very cheap. And I think we have to get to abundance in order to deal with massive joblessness. So it's a big problem, and we have a you know, a few years to solve it, but I think we're, we're not paying enough attention to it. Okay, so now the book that I picked up is The Economic Singularity. You have several other books, so which, which is the latest one that, that you have written? So my last book is called Artificial, and Artificial Intelligence and the Two Singularities. It's published by an academic publisher, which means it's um, courageously expensive. Um, but it, it uh, covers the whole subject, uh, and, and my previous two books which, as you say, economic singularity and uh, surviving AI, they individually cover one each of the, of the two singularities, which the, the new book makes up. 
Okay, now as I was reading the economic singularity, uh, I, I was um, kind of put on defense. One, like I said, when when you were mentioning the jobs that they're going to be taking from us, and I was I got defensive, thinking, well, they can't take this job, they can't take that job. The other thing I got defensive about, and you mentioned that it, it is um, particularly uh, maybe an, an American feeling about UBI, right? This is the universal uh, basic income. Is that what it's called? Yeah, that's right. Uh, it's that you were saying that this is going to be essential to making this new world work, right? Where where the machines have taken our jobs. Um, you were saying this, this is going to be a critical part of this plan. Well, what do you see as the plan? What is the economic singularity? So economic singularity is the term I've given to uh, the process of moving to a post-jobs world. We don't know for sure that machines will take over many and perhaps most of the jobs humans currently do. And we also don't know for sure that if they do, we won't invent lots of new ones. A lot of people think, you know, that they won't take over the jobs, and a lot of other people think that they will, but we will invent lots of new ones. I think they will take over most of the existing jobs, and we won't create lots of new ones. I think instead we have to get our heads around the idea that we're going to live in a world where perhaps probably a majority of people just don't do jobs. Now, in that world, we can't, we shouldn't allow everybody to starve. You know, that would be terrible. So we're going to have to find ways of giving money to people who, who have not got jobs. Now, um, people think that in America there's no welfare state and in Europe there is. It's not really true. You do have a welfare state, and the European welfare state isn't as socialist as a lot of American think, people think it is. That They're not terribly different, but there's culturally perhaps a greater acceptance in Europe. You don't necessarily need to do a job to be a valid human being. That, that strikes a bad chord with a lot of people in America. But I think we're going to have to get our heads around that idea. Mm-hmm. But I also don't think that we can just say, fine, we'll tax all the people who are still working and the people who've got a lot of money and just give everybody else lots and lots of cash because the people who've got money will hide it. You know, they'll all go and live in somewhere which has a very low tax rate. Um, so that's why I think we have to have abundance. We have to have an economy in which prices get really low in order to be able to afford the transfers, which will be inevitable if people aren't doing jobs. And I think this business of this this idea of abundance, this idea of a Star Trek economy is entirely possible. Um, Machines will produce goods and services really efficiently, much more efficiently than we do at the moment. And the other thing that's happening is energy is getting much, much cheaper. Electricity uh, collection, storage and transmission is getting much, much cheaper, much more efficient. Those two things together, very, very efficient AI-led production and cheap energy I think we we can have this economy of abundance, which means we can afford the post-job society. Okay, we are here with uh, Callum Chase. Callum, I want to thank you again for joining us. We're just about over with this interview. We're just about out of time. But let me ask you one last question. Uh, What do you feel? Is there an existential threat posed by AI to the human race? I know know that sounds kind of um, outlandish or or, uh, kind of provocative question to ask, but what do you think? I think it's a very reasonable question, and the short answer is yes. Uh, if we create a superintelligence that really dislikes us, we're probably toast. So let's not do that. <laughs> All right. Uh, Callum Chase, again, thank you for joining us. I'm going to uh, uh, post a link on our, our Facebook page to your books, and I wish you the best, Callum. Thank you again for joining us. I'll get a hold of you. Maybe we can do this again some other time. That'll be fun. Great pleasure, Dave. All right, Callum. Thank you again. That was Callum Chase. Again, check out his books. He has several of them. AI, The Two Singularities, The Economic Singularity, and Surviving AI. Callum Chase is an expert when it comes to artificial intelligence. And if you don't believe me, just check out his website. I posted it on our show page. You're listening to AM 1080, KSEO Santa Cruz Flight 1080. Back after this.